Okay, um, so I'm going to spend the next half hour telling you about the Spinnaker project, but I'm going to start off with some bits of ancient history. Um, yesterday, Jeff told us about how 30 years ago, he, he had a sort of sense of deja vu today about how things were in the 1980s. Um, I can go back even further than that. <coughs> um, am I making those loud noises or is somebody else? Is it me? How about that? I don't want to be making loud noises all the way through. That would not be good. Um, anyway, what was I up to? Yes, so uh, this year, in fact, is the 200th anniversary of the birth of Ada Lovelace, the only legitimate child of Lord Byron, who had an interesting life himself. Um, and in her notes, which there's a picture of at the bottom of this slide, but you can't read it, and even if I made it big, you still wouldn't be able to read it. It's a fairly illegible handwriting. She writes, I have my hopes, and very distinct ones too, of one day getting cerebral phenomena such that I can put them into mathematical equations. In short, a law or laws for the mutual actions of the molecules of the brain. I hope to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. Okay, that's a pretty good hope. Now, um, Ada died at the age of 36. She died quite young. This is a shame. Had she lived another 30 years and had her three score years of 10, she might have completed this quest and saved us all a lot of trouble. <laughs> On the other hand, we wouldn't have anything interesting to do now. Um, if we come a bit closer, uh, 60 years ago, uh, the picture at the top left of this slide um, is a, a fairly inconspicuous house in the south of Manchester. It's about a mile and a half from where I live. Uh, in fact, I went past it last week on the way to my sister's house and took this photo. Um, the brick archway to the left of the house has a blue plaque, and that's shown larger at the bottom. And this tells you that this is Alan Turing's house. And it says, Alan Turing, 1912 to 1954, founder of computer science and cryptographer, whose work was key to breaking the wartime Enigma codes, lived and died here. And this is, in fact, the house um, where Turing lived in Manchester and the house where he was found dead in mysterious circumstances. Now, Turing um, spent his last years in Manchester um, for reasons that I'm going to come on to shortly. Most of what he did while he was in Manchester was actually biology. Uh, he worked on morphogenesis, um, the process whereby biological cells which start identical effectively break the symmetry so that some of the cells become brain cells, some become skin cells and so on. And he worked principally on the mathematics of, of that process but he did write one paper uh, that we've already talked about in this meeting which is the one shown on the right. It was the paper entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence and section one is labeled The Imitation Game, um, a little title that Hollywood has been using recently. And if, you, if you've seen the film, The Imitation Game, you might have spotted that in that they actually say he has a paper entitled The Imitation Game, which is a mistake. Uh, the paper's entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. But this paper starts by saying, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? and then goes on to develop the theme at some considerable length um, and comes round to suggesting that the better way of posing this question is in what he called the imitation game and what subsequent generations all know as the Turing test. Um, and we had some debate yesterday about whether this is or isn't the right test, but bear in mind Turing wrote this paper two years after the first programmable computer ran its first program. Okay, so this was very early days in the history of computing. And Turing was reasonably confident that by the end of the last century, machines would pass his test. As far as he was concerned, all they needed were larger memories. He forecast that by the end of the century, 
computers might have a gigabyte of memory. That was a spectacular projection and spectacularly accurate because that is about the point where the PC on your desk would have had about a gigabyte of main memory. And remember, he was writing this at a time when machines had a few hundred bytes of memory. And so this was a huge extrapolation. He got some other things wrong. Um, he was quite confident that the Manchester machine that he'd gone north to use was fast enough, um, didn't need any more speed, it just needed more memory, and it would pass his test. Now, my take on why it's ultimately proved so hard to build machines that would pass the Turing test is we can't build artificial intelligence because we've never quite worked out what natural intelligence is. Okay? And that feeds directly into the theme of this workshop. What we need to do is go back, look at the thing inside each of our heads, and try and work out how that does what it does, because it's clearly a bigger mystery than we thought, and it's a bigger mystery than Turing thought. And it was probably a little bit too hard for Ada Lovelace as well. Uh, had she actually lived longer, I'm not sure she would have cracked it. Um, now, Turing came to Manchester because Manchester had the first, the first built machine that executed Turing's big idea, his idea from the 1930s of universal computing machine. Um, the Manchester machine here is shown with its two principal designers, Freddie Williams and Tom Kilburn, and actually, they were not particularly interested in building a computer. Um, the big problem of their day was memory, and they had this idea. They'd worked in the Second World War using cathode ray tube uh, systems to store analog signals for radar in aircraft, and they had this idea that with a bit of adjustment, they could use these same cathode ray tubes to store digital information. So they then thought, well, OK, we're building a digital memory. How do we test it? And the simplest test they could think of was to embed it in a very simple programmable computer. And uh, as a result of this, they accidentally gave Manchester this very significant position in computer history as having the first operational stored program computer. It was a tiny one. It wasn't very useful. And the following year, Morris Wilkes at Cambridge built a useful stored program computer. Um, but that's a, a fine detail. We, we'll, we'll claim what we can for Manchester from, <coughs> from their first achievement. Now, that was 1948. Manchester built a series of machines, um, starting from the baby, in the 60s, uh, the Manchester Atlas machine was built, which was the world's first supercomputer. Um, it was capable very nearly of doing a million floating point operations a second, and it introduced a number of important uh, computer architecture features to the world, um, of which perhaps the most significant is it was the first machine with virtual memory. Um, it wasn't called virtual memory, but it was virtual memory, and uh, at the end of the 60s, it was licensed to IBM for far too little money. If there's anybody here from IBM, uh, if they'd like to settle the debt with the university, I'll take a check. Um, anyway, um, there's a series of machines, and the most recent is the one I'm going to talk about in a little while um, on the Spinnaker device. Um, but here's a picture of a Spinnaker chip. You'll see it again. It has 18 computers on it. Um, and these are just small ARM processors, the kind of thing you might have found in your mobile phone 10 years ago or your portable music player or your digital camera. And there are 63 years between those two Manchester machines. Um, and you can look at the progress that we've achieved in those 63 years. So the baby machine used 3.5 kilowatts of electrical power. It executed 700 instructions a second. And that gives you an, a, 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 an energy per instruction of five joules. A modern ARM processor, a reasonably energy efficient processor, uses 40 milliwatts. It executes some 200 million instructions a second in our case. We're not very aggressive with clocks because we like to save power. And that gives you a number with lots of zeros after the decimal place. And if you take the ratio of those two numbers, the energy efficiency of computers 
has improved by a factor in the region of 25 billion between those two machines. It's a huge rate of progress, and it's one of the things that makes computers so pervasive today. You know, so whenever I walk into a room, I can be pretty confident that there are more ARM computers in the room than there are humans. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, every smartphone's got about eight or ten of them in it. Um, th this is a, a fantastic rate of progress. Um, of course, there's another nice Manchester link in that the unit of energy is named after the bloke with the impressive beard um, who was born in Salford, which I think I'm far enough away from home, I can say, is a part of Manchester. Um, those of you... you, you I'm, I'm quite a long way away, so the, the joke may be lost on some of you, but... Uh, Salford and Manchester are adjacent parts of basically the same city, but there is a different football team, okay? <laughs> so so there's, there's quite an issue of, of uh, distinction there. Um, now, I've been sort of giving this story for quite some time, and a couple of years ago, uh, a lady in the audience said, well, if computers are so much more energy efficient, why is it they use more and more of the world's energy resources? Right? And this is true. It's a very good question. Um, and somebody else pointed out to me that it's an example of quite a famous observation uh, known as Jevons' paradox. Jevons, um, in, nine, in 1865, uh, wrote this book called The Coal Question. And what he observed was that James Watt had introduced new technology into steam engines and it was much more efficient than the previous steam engine. Uh, the design was due to Thomas Newcomen. And so you might think, we now have much more efficient steam engines, so we'll need less coal to keep them going. But what Jevons observed was that the opposite was true. As technology made the equipment more efficient, the overall consumption of resource went up. Okay? And you can see why, actually, and it's because as you make things more efficient, the cost of ownership goes down and the utility goes up and the utility actually goes up faster than the efficiency um, improves. And therefore you integrate it out and you find you burn more resource. Now there have been huge, uh, Jevons was an economist and there have been huge debates amongst economists as to where and when and how this observation applies and of course um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that trying to save energy is a waste of time um, but it does present a challenge to engineers because it, the, the key is if the improvement is due to techno technological advance, then this paradox seems to apply. If the improvement is due to legislation, then it doesn't apply. And if you legislate, so if you make the price of coal go up faster than the efficiency of the machines, then the use doesn't increase. Okay, so it is possible to introduce energy conservation legislation that works. Um, but what we've seen in computers, I think, is exactly this, that as we've improved their energy efficiency, their utility has gone up spectacularly, and, uh, and their total energy consumption has risen as a result. Now, this is, has got almost nothing to do with the main part of my talk, so I'd better get on to that. Um, looking at the progress in computers... And, and the issues of the fact that we still don't understand how our brains work, which seems to me to be a huge gap in scientific knowledge, um, then the obvious question is, can we use the kind of computing resource which is now readily available to accelerate our understanding of brain function? And as that understanding grows, can we use that to work out how to build more effective computing equipment, whatever that means? And those are the two high-level research questions that motivate uh, the project that I'm going to talk about, which is the Spinnaker project. We've been working on this for a long time. Um, the goal has always been to put a million mobile phone processors into one machine, connect them in a way that maintains that they can run biological models in biological real time. And the observation is that even with a million of these, this would only get us to about 1% of the complexity of the human brain, so it's a long way to go. So you might ask, why did I stop at a million processors? Um, and the answer, of course, is it's a big number, but it's about as big as you can get on a sensible academic research budget. 
And if you think 1% one, 1 of the human brain is a fairly low target, I, I prefer to think of it as 10 whole mouse brains. Okay? So that's the kind of scale that we're aiming for. <coughs> um, to build the machine, we have some principles. And the most important of these is the first. The brain has many different network configurations in it. We don't want to have to rewire the hardware for each different um, brain region we're interested in. And so we do the usual computer science thing of virtualizing the topology, which means if you have a network you want to model, I have my million cores. You can, in principle, put any neuron on any core, and we'll connect them together with the interconnect logic that you want. This also means, of course, that if you want the network to change while the thing's running, you want developmental stuff to happen or new, uh, synaptic rewiring, um, this is covered by the same process. There are constraints. There are lots of constraints, but um, it's doable. The second principle is it's a very parallel machine. The thing that kills parallel computers is synchronization, so we don't do it. Okay? So the machine effectively runs asynchronously. Every one of these million cores just uh, runs ahead at whatever rate it feels like. Well, and, and time models itself. So each core keeps a local uh, time reference, and things happen when they happen. And thirdly, the engineering principle. Um, it's a big machine, so it's going to be expensive to run, so we need to care about energy efficiency. And I believe we now live in a modern world where it's valid to look at computers and say, processors are free. What costs money is the energy to feed them? And this is true if you buy your processors from almost anywhere apart from Intel, I think. Um, sorry, my, my prejudices are beginning to show. It's, so um, we put this together in, in a system, um, and it's a 2D mesh. In computer terms, it's a very conventional system. It's, uh, each node in the mesh has two chips in. One is the bespoke chip we've designed, and the other one is a, a big lump of commodity DRAM. Um, and we need that because some of the data structures are quite large. And then this thing is just connected in a 2D mesh. And the goal is we have to be able to get um, information around this system in a small fraction of a millisecond to maintain the objective of biological real time. So we spent five years designing the chip. Um, designing state-of-the-art digital SOCs is really beyond academic research resources. This one isn't state-of-the-art. It's 130 nanometer. Um, again, that's keeping the cost budget down. But with 130 nanometer technology, we could get the 18 ARM cores onto the chip with quite a lot of local memory. Um, I'm, I'm never quite sure. I've spent my career looking at pictures of chips, and so they mean things to me. Uh, I'm not, with this audience, I'm guessing about half the people here can look at a picture of a chip and read something into it, and the other half haven't a clue what I'm talking about and think it's a piece of abstract art. But um, anyway, the, the, the dark areas on that chip are memory. So most of the chip is just, is just memory. It's, uh, I'll talk about what's in there in the next slide. Uh, the processes themselves disappear into some random logic. Uh, processes are free, so you can't see them. Um, and we package this device. Uh, the top left diagram shows the, the package substrate. It has a Spinnaker chip. And then glued on top of that is a DRAM die. So it's kind of fairly crude 3D technology. Um, gold wire bonded, and then it's all put together in the attractive black plastic package at the bottom left and looks just about like any other chip you've ever seen, except it's got a nice sale logo on it. The architecture has been fairly carefully tuned to the problem. So this is not a general purpose computer, even though it looks like, in architecture terms, a fairly conventional uh, massively parallel machine. Um, it's not general purpose. It's been tuned to the particular task in hand. And so if you look at the chip itself, you can say, you know, the brighter green bit at the top right um, is the instruction memory. That's where the code lives. Um, the data, the neural state, is in the memory next to that. Uh, the processor is somewhere in the blue bit. Um, and all the synaptic state is pushed off 
onto the local DRAM because the synaptic state is too big to store in the amount of memory we can fit on the chip. And at the heart of the chip, there's a router. Um, in, in computing terms, uh, spikes are communicated as packets, and packets are handled by packet switch routers. But instead of the router being something that fills a slot in a 19-inch rack, it's a couple of square millimeters in the middle of the die. And routing is actually the key to Spinnaker. The, the innovation in the machine is in how we get packets around in biological real time. And the key to that is to keep the packets really small. Um, we use a form of address event representation, but we map AER into a packet switch fabric. And the packets carry typically the event ID, the AER event, 32 bits, so we can support up to 4 billion logically distinct neurons and a little bit of housekeeping. We run a number of different packet types, but the key one for neural modeling is the multicast packet. And the idea here is that when, a when the neuron spikes, the processor that's modeling that neuron drops a packet into the fabric, and that packet then finds its way to all the relevant destinations, which may be 100,000 across the machine. And that all happens. It's all brokered in hardware. And the rest of the stuff is about system management, so I won't go into that. You can add a payload onto the packet if you want to carry more information. But typically, all we're interested in is a spike as a pure event at a point in time. The time is implicit in the time the packet's sent. So all you need to know is which neuron it came from. And that's the AER principle. Now, the tricky bit is how do you get those packets to go to the right places? And each chip has at its heart a router, as, I, as you saw in the picture. Um, there are 32 bits of event ID. In principle, this requires a table with 4 billion entries, um, which is not feasible to implement directly, even on today's advanced silicon. And so what you have to do is optimize that somehow. And the way we do that is we, we observe that not all packets pass through every router, so you don't need to have a table entry for every possible event ID, just the ones that you're going to see at this particular router. And there's quite a lot of commonality. People tend to look at large networks in population projection terms, and so you might be able to use a single entry for the population rather than for each neuron. So we use a, a three-state, a ternary CAM, um, and the CAM contains an entry for every spike identifier that, that particular chip is going to see. It has don't cares in it, so we can do population routing with single entries. We can actually do much more general logic compression. Um, indeed, some of the early mapping software uses Espresso um, to compress the tables. But actually, table size doesn't, hasn't been a problem so far. And we physically have 1,024 entries, and that seems to be plenty. For I, I can design a pathological network that breaks this, but typical networks uh, seem to fit very comfortably. And then we have default mechanisms um, that mean we don't need entries uh, in every location. And, and there's a default routing. If a packet arrives that isn't matched in the CAM, then it basically passes straight through the chip. So if it arrived at the west, it goes out at the east. And this means you can do a point-to-point -point connection from anywhere to anywhere in the machine with just three table entries, one at source, one at one turning point, and one at the destination. Um, now, typically, of course, we're not doing point to point, um, but uh, that gives you a feel. So the problem of mapping a particular neural problem onto the machine is a problem of, of understanding how to map the topology. And here's a, a simple example of a, a few populations on the left with some connections drawn as a graph, and we, we, we view the graph representation as the canonical way to describe the network. And then we decide which processes to put those populations on, and then we decide the routing. And for that particular graph, you need three table entries at each node in the six-node graph. And so it maps quite simply. So the thing to try and get your head around with Spinnaker 
is that mapping a problem onto the machine is, is unconventional. You start off by splitting the problem into two components. The graph that describes the connectivity of the network and the functionality which describes what your neural function is, what your synaptic function is, what learning rule you want and so on. And you separate the connectivity from the function. The connectivity is mapped into the routing hardware, so it's all hardware brokered. And the functionality is conventional software. Um, and so, if you want a different neural model, you have to write a bit of real-time C code, but then you can compile it up, and any model you like is possible. The architecture is tuned to the point neuron view of the world. We've heard a number of concerns about whether that is the ideal view, but it's not casting concrete on Spinnaker. If you want to elaborate dendritic trees, it's uh, what I call only software. Um, my software people don't like the phrase only software, so they say the system's only hardware. Um, and the key thing is that when, when the neuron spikes, the processor that generates that spike, that determines it's time for the neuron it's modeling to spike, simply drops the AR event into the fabric. It has no idea where it's going. Okay? You drop it into the fabric, and the fabric delivers it magically. Because we've been aiming for biological real-time, then the, the software level of the machine has, has a strong real-time system feel to it. Um, and basically, the idea is that the processors do nothing, and they have an, an energy-efficient low-power mode for doing nothing in. And then they wake up when events happen. They do something, and they go back to sleep. That's the energy efficiency strategy. And with typical spiking neural models, then you have events when packets arrive. You have events when you transfer the synaptic data, which is done by a little separate DMA engine, direct memory access, for those who care. Um, and you have a timer event, which if you're running a, a typical millisecond timer tick, drives the differential equation solvers. This has all been assembled. Um, the little black packages tessellate. You can tile the world with them uh, because large printed circuit boards are expensive. We run with a particular size board, which has 864 cores on. I sort of think of that as being roughly the scale of a small insect brain in terms of the complexity of network it can model. And then these connect together through high-speed serial links. And um, the box on the left has 20,000 cores on, so that's about frog brain scale. And the rack on the right has 100,000 cores, um, which is about mouse brain scale. And uh, so it's 100,000 cores, up to 100 million neurons. Um, and our ultimate goal is to go to the million, which will require nine more of those racks. And they can be wired together, and we can still maintain real time. Wiring them together is good fun. Um, here's a day in the life of a research student in my group. Um, fortunately, he used time-lapse photography. Otherwise, this would be a very boring part of the talk. Uh, it took him three hours to wire this. Now, if you look carefully, you can see LEDs lighting up. The machine is actually telling him which board to plug the wire into. Um, he, he wrote the code to do that. He also wrote the program that devised the wiring that connects all those boards together into a single toroid um, with a constraint that no wire must be more than a meter long. Okay? And that's a constraint we have to continue to apply even when we have 10 racks. No point-to-point -point connection must be longer than a meter and that's to make the high-speed serial links work reliably. Um, Johnny Heathcote, who, who did this, uh, wrote the programs to compute the wiring, wrote the program to light the boards up to put the wires in. What you can't hear, because it's a silent movie, is his laptop is also giving him spoken instructions as to which socket in the board to put the wire in. At some point, he'll have a tea break. Um, has, it, has it happened yet? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, we've had the tea break, all right. Um, I knew that, that's one of the highlights of this movie. Uh, <laughs> there's not much longer to go. Um, the only other thing to look forward to is the slightly smug look on his face when he's finished. Um, and there you are. <laughs> and he put all those. <coughs> 
He put all those wires in. It took him four hours, and, and because it was all program controlled, he didn't make a single mistake. So the machine uh, works perfectly after that. So what can we do with this technology? This workshop is supposed to be at applications. Well, one thing we've done, which is a very small-scale application, is we got interested in a paper written by Wolfgang Mass on a stochastic neural network that solves Sudoku. And uh, we map that onto Spinica, and it works. On the right, you can see the green numbers are the right answers. The red numbers are the wrong answers, which come up. And the brightness of the green tells you how confident that particular bunch of neurons is that it's found the right answer. This is a stochastic neural network. Again, because our, our neuron model is software, if you want a stochastic neuron, you just write one, and then you can run it. Um, It's real time, so you can also stick it in a robot. This is quite an old video now of a robot um, that's got a big spinnaker board elegantly balanced on its back. Um, it's using uh, DVS sensors. I think these are uh, Toby Del Brooks DVS sensors. You can see the sensor output in, in the picture on the left of the screen. It's fairly noisy. Um, all this robot uh, is doing is it's hardwired to like angles at 90 degrees and not to like angles at 45 degrees so if it sees this cross it backs away and if it sees the plus sign it moves towards it. It's a fairly simple piece of, uh, you know, it's not, not going to impress any roboticists um, but it is all being done uh, with neural networks and it's the kind of beginning of something that we expect, expect to scale up to bigger things. Um, one of our early targets in the near future um, is we're very interested in Chris Elias Smith's spawn model um, because this is an example of a large neural network that does something. Um, it doesn't just sit there making little cortical patterns. It actually solves problems. It's multi-behavioral. And the numbers are on the slide. Currently, when Chris runs this, it takes two to three hours for each second of real time on a fairly large cluster machine. And we're confident that within two or three months, we'll have this running in real time on Spinnaker. Um, it's, a, it's a nice challenge. And the student who's doing this, Andrew Mundy, has, has had to do some fairly clever things to make this work because um, Elias Smith's neural engineering framework has some rather unpleasant properties in biological terms. It has very high mean firing rates, um, which our system doesn't like very much. And it has all-to-all -all connectivity, um, which, again, isn't very efficient and not kind of what we've tuned for. But it still appears to be doable with a few tricks. Um, and we're always looking out for promising large-scale models. So yesterday I was paying attention some of the time. Um, and I noticed that you know, HDM sounded like an interesting thing to try and map onto Spinnaker. Um, and Libra um, also sounded like a a nice large-scale vision system um, that we could probably do something with. And uh, so I'll wrap up there. Um, the Spinnaker system has been 15 years in conception. Well, actually, rather more than that now. Um, eight years in construction. But now we have large systems. We've actually got the circuit boards with a million processors on already made. Um, the hold-up for assembling the big machine is a typ typical piece of university politics. Uh, the university has appointed a new IT director who has decided to change the policy about where the data centers are going to be. Um, so all the machines with the, you know, that can provide 100 kilowatts of electricity and get the heat out afterwards, um, all those rooms are being reconfigured. Um, so we just don't have a physical place to construct it at the moment. Um, we've got boards, small boards, um, and some larger ones out with about 40 different groups around the world who are doing... Uh, strange and interesting things with it. We've built the 20,000 and 100,000 core machines. Um, the software hasn't quite caught up with the hardware on that scale. Um, but we are now confident we can get to our million core system. Um, the question is, what do you do with a million cores? I mean, in principle, we can run real-time models with a billion neurons in. Uh, and you have to be careful what you say and qualify this, okay? The, we, 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 a billion neurons each with 1,000 inputs. If you want 10,000 inputs to be biologically realistic, then scale the number of neurons down. Um, and 
This work is now being supported through the EU Human Brain Project, um, and this will lead to the large machines being effectively available openly online uh, for all comers. If you can do what you want to do with remote access, then that should be straightforward. Obviously, for things like real-time physical robotics, you can't do closed loop over the internet at long distance, so you need physically more proximal hardware. And the graphic down the right-hand side of this slide, which you can't read, but I think it's, it, it's quite similar to the one that, that, that Jennifer showed us earlier, um, scales of energy efficiency. Uh, you know, at the bottom, biology is the clear winner um, at 10 to the minus 14 joules per synaptic event. At the top, a very complicated detailed biological model running on a supercomputer at one joule per synaptic event is the loser, uh, but of course very detailed. And there's a scale of things, and Spinnaker is not the most efficient, um, but to get more efficiency, you have to compromise some flexibility. So there are trade-offs, and, and my view is that um, we don't really quite know what we want to make yet, ultimately, and therefore a flexible machine that allows you to explore has its value. When you've worked out what you want to make, then sure, go and design it all in very efficient analog circuits, and you can improve the energy efficiency. Um, Carl Heinz's system is, is shown on there. It's, I think, two orders of magnitude, more efficient per synaptic event. Um, but I think we're in a comfortable place. You know, we're, we're energy efficient and cheap compared with supercomputers, um, but we're still very flexible because there's still a lot of software in everything apart from how you do the, con the connectivity. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Can I, who, first? Yes, uh, can I go with a lovely talk, amazing amount of work over many years, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to Carhan's talk later this afternoon, but I, I have to ask for some contrasting between what Winfred Wilkley just talked about and, and you did now. There's a lot of commonality in your thinking in terms of relying on processors, cheap processors, to really handle all the neural aspects, and it's about connectivity and memory. Uh, Winfred talked about doing stacked wafer scale. You talked about stacking little you know, you, you put the RAM right on top of the other chips. Um, how would, how is, you know, I don't know how to contract, I don't know enough about these systems to understand the trade-offs between those two different approaches. And how you guys, both you, Winfried, and you would, would think about those trade-offs in terms of, you know, what, what, what's better for when, or what's going to, you know, what's going to, how is this all going to play out in some sense? And so I don't know if you could just, just give some overall comments about the trade-offs that you might see doing something like with Winfrey talked about, with what you talked about, which are similar in many ways, but different in other ways. And yeah. just any kind of clarification would be very helpful. So if, if you're setting out with the goal of building a big system on a modest academic budget, then lots of things are constrained by that budgetary environment. Okay. Um, our decision to put the memory inside the package was quite late. We, we looked at this. It was suggested to us by our packaging company. In fact, we had a packaging subcontractor, and they said, why don't you put the die inside? We looked at this. We worked out that it actually saves about 15% of our system <coughs> power just to move the memory from a centimeter away on the circuit board to inside the package. So we did that. Um, but in general, um, what we can do is constrained not only by what we can design, what we can pay for. So we, you know, we, could, we could obviously design on 65 nanometer or smaller process technologies, but then our entire build budget would go on mask making. We'd have nothing left to make the machine with. 130 nanometer is cheap for mask making. It's a quarter of a million pounds to get the mask made. Um, so there's lots of pragmatic decisions going on in here. I would not say in any sense that Spinnaker is the best we can do on today's technology. Okay? It's the best we could do with the resources available, including financial resources. Uh, IBM has bigger resources to bring to bear on these things, um, and therefore they can make different decisions. Yes, I mean, there are loads of trade-offs. Um, you know, one, one, one of the things we did on Spinnaker was we worried a lot about the communication power between the chips. In fact, it turns out we worried about it too much. 
because the, the communication power cost in the machine is negligible. Okay, we, we, we just made that too efficient. We should have made it cheaper and less efficient uh, to get the right balance. Um, and that really embarrasses us when it comes to uh, going from one circuit board to another because our very efficient system uses lots of wires. And effectively multiplexing all those wires down is, 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 is expensive and would have been avoidable. So we get things wrong. Um, building this system, there are a million design decisions to take. And you simply can't afford to optimize every one of them. Right? Some of them you've just got to take a, take a guess and hope you're not far wrong. The, the huge risk for us is, uh, is getting the chip wrong. Okay? We had a very big gamble to take when we produced the full chip layout. Do we go straight to mask making or do we go through a multi-project wafer to check it out first? Okay? If we do it directly to mask making and get it right, we save ourselves £100,000. If we go directly to mask making and get it wrong, we lose £150,000, right? So I had, and this is 10% of my entire bill budget, is basically on this toss of a coin. Can we get it right first time? And, and we went straight to mask making, and the things work. Um, now, we've been designing chips for quite a long time, so we know about designing chips that have escape routes in. Okay, so we design chips so that if something doesn't quite work, there's probably a workaround. Not everything, um, but uh, I, I mean, just designing that square centimeter of silicon took about 40 man years of effort over five years. Had we done that in industry, we'd have probably done it in 18 months, but probably in about three or 400 man years. Okay, so it's the, side, it's the sort of design that industry would put 100 people on. Uh, we did it with four or five. Um, and a few students. So it, it, it's a very complex compromise. Um, and, and, you, and you have to take guesses. And I, all I would say is we're very pleased with where we ended up. Okay? Um, a lot of gambles paid off. So uh, first of all, really a beautiful presentation, real pleasure to listen to, and quite a beautiful result. I wanted to ask you, Steve, to elaborate on the programmability of the cores uh, so that we can understand what kind of neural mechanisms and synaptic mechanisms could be, in principle, programmed in. Okay, so the, 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 the cores are <coughs> standard, off-the-shelf, integer ARM cores. We have no floating-point hardware, so that's first constraint. And, and within the European Human Brain Project, we are planning a second generation of this machine where we're going for sort of 10x everything good and one of the things our software guys have asked us to do is put some floating point hardware on, please. Um, right, so, so, so um, but we don't have it here, so every, all the differential equation solvers have to run in fixed point. Um, which is doable, but it's more work. And this is another of these hardware trade-offs I've seen several times, particularly in my industrial career in the 80s. Um, where the, the, the hardware guys put things on because they see what a dog's breakfast the software guys make of doing it without them, right? You know, the first arm didn't have a multiplier because you could write a software program that was efficient to do it in software, but the software guys didn't do it that way, they did it very inefficiently, and so we put a hardware multiplier on because we just couldn't stand what they were doing. Um, <clears throat> that kind of thing happens quite a lot. Um, the constraints... So, so you're running, as long as you're happy with fixed point code, anything you can program we can do. The constraint is how long you got to do it in. So um, a synaptic event, you want to handle in a few tens of processor cycles. Okay, so you want the code that handles the synapse to be the order of a few tens of instructions. Um, now, it's quite easy to do fixed synapses in that time. Um, it's not possible to do anything approaching true STDP in that time. So you end up with a trade-off. Um, there's also rather a subtle complexity to do with plasticity rules that's a result of the event-driven nature of the machine. That you've only actually got the synaptic data where you want it 
at the time of a presynaptic event. It's somewhere rather inaccessible at the time of the postsynaptic event. And so th those who've written STDP algorithms will realize this sounds inconvenient, which it is. It isn't insuperable. Uh, we have ways around that. Um, but th th we're still working on, I mean, we have plasticity rules that run, but we're still working on their efficiency. Um, in terms of the, the neural model, um, I've got a guy on, on, on my group who's very fussy about numerical accuracy. And uh, he spent a lot of time worrying about the integration algorithms that we use. He's also worried a lot more than I ever did about what kind of random number generator you require to generate true stochastic behavior in a machine where you have a million cores, right? Because if you use a simplistic random number generator, there's a very efficient five cycle ARM random number generator, which is a 33-bit LFSR. If you use that, you'll get correlations across a machine this big. And the one thing neural networks do is find correlations where you don't want them to. Right. So the network would train to recognize that this processor over here was running three ticks behind that one in its random numbers. Um, so we've had to get much more sophisticated in, in things like random number algorithms. Have I answered your question? Yeah, I, I think great. It's, it feels we've rambled quite a long yeah, time. No, that was good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> one more quick question. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful talk, and I sympathize so much with the answer you gave to Jeff's question, <laughs> how much pragmatic matters. A very simple question. What is the ratio or how much DRAM memory per ARM core in this machine? Um, so that, that's, the DRAM is 128 megabytes, and we're typically running neurons on 16 cores on the chip, so 8 megabytes per core. 8 megabytes per core. Okay, thanks. It's, it's enough to store... Um, a million synapses per core. Mm -hmm. there was, there was, I saw a slide from somebody else earlier that had the spinnaker, had the wrong number of synapses on it. Okay, we, 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 we typically have a million synapses per core. Yeah. It's really efficient. Thank you. Hello. Well, thank you again. <laughs>